Hey, good morning to all who are joining us here uh, from the College Church uh, in Lancaster, Massachusetts. It is uh, Sabbath, August 8 already, and I'm Einar Ram, and with me is my friend uh, Roger Prather. And uh, we're going to remove our masks, and as we're doing that, I'm going to embarrass Roger and say happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> so 29 years old, right? 29. 29, absolutely. So, <laughs> you know, there's an old saying that I came across, how old would you be if you didn't know how old you are? You know, there's a lot of, that's a good question, you know. Um, and a lot of talk today, of course, is, you know, uh, the, the old, uh, what, 70 is the new 60, and, you know, every, everything is, you know, you look at the people running for office, for president, you know, you know, five decades ago, we'd say they're too old, but, mm -hmm. you know, they're going at it, and it's amazing. So, so uh, and part of it's out of, I think, you know, we are healthier because of a medication and lifestyle, and some of it is just probably necessity. You know, some people just, you know, need to work longer. They need to stay healthy longer because of retirement issues, you know, yeah. so... So, how have you been, Roger? I'm well. You're well? Yeah. So, anything new in your life? No. No. Nope. It's, the world is what it was <laughs> the last time you saw me. I think it's a little crazier. I don't know. It, I, it might be. A little bit crazier, but no, I agree. It's good to have you back. So, you, it'll be you and me this Sabbath and the next Sabbath. Yes, and then so unfortunately my work schedule changes, so I won't be able to be here. Won't be able to be here, okay. Well, let's pray. Would you pray for us as we start? Sure. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to come together and worship and study. We pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit here with us. Enlighten our hearts and our minds. Help us to learn the things that you want us to learn so that we may be witnesses for you in this, in this world and this time. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, Roger, we're going to jump into lesson number six unlimited possibilities <clears throat> and I know we, we, you, we both have read through this lesson what do you think is the takeaway from this lesson like if you if you read all the each lesson what do you think is the take home that we as believers need to know and implement uh, Whoever you are and whatever you are, there's a job for you to do. I think that's probably the, that's it. the so, number one lesson to be gleaned from this week. Now, let me ask you this question. Do you think, where do you think we are on that spectrum? Have we, are we fully implemented in that model of ministry or that approach? Are we halfway there or barely even started? as far as tapping into every member's, let's go active membership, because if we doubt, doubt at all Adventist churches, if you, you know, half the members are there, you know, are active, you know, where would, if you just, you know, take a total shot in the dark estimate, guesstimate. Oh, I don't think it's a shot in the dark. I, I have very firm beliefs in this, <laughs> this area. I would say that um, from 1844 until today. Yep we've actually regressed in implementing this model. Yeah. We've actually gone the opposite direction yeah. from what we should be going. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's a trend that you see in all Protestant churches. Yep. Um, you know, when, when the, the Methodist movement started, um, you saw massive involvement that continued up in, in through the 19th century yep. and then they were an, they're an older denomination than we are, but over time you just saw them move more and more towards that. You know, you have a few hundred people sitting in the audience and yep. they believe everything and they say the right words and repeat the right creeds or whatever. And then all the work is really done by the guy standing up front and yep. maybe there's a few actors behind them. And you know, in 1844 and through the rest of the 19th century, our denomination was, um, you know, we didn't have an established um, clergy, you know, we didn't have things you're like... You're going to say, I'm the problem. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, you, yeah, you're the problem. <laughs> but we didn't. We didn't have an established yeah. clergy. You know, I, some of our leaders like, um, like uh, James White, 
um, and a few others had a ministerial background in other denominations, and they, they brought that with them. But everybody had, they were, they were tent makers. We were, a, we were a church of tent makers, and everybody was a minister, and, you know, they had their vocations where they earned their living, and then part of that was, you know, funneled into the church through tithes and offerings, and it yeah. paid for the printing presses and, and the travel and all those sorts of things. And then we became institutionalized, and yeah. um, we don't have to go off on that tangent, but um, we, I think we have. We've regressed where people, I grew up in, you know, I grew up in the church, and so yeah, me too. you always have this, this idea that if you want to be a servant uh, of the church, well, you have to be a pastor, mm. or you have to be a teacher in one of our schools, um, or something like that. Or, a, you know, a doctor in one of our hospitals, you have to become a missionary, and you have to fly to Africa, and yeah. you know, inoculate children with ADRA or something like that. And if you're not, then, well, you know, your job is just to go to work and, you know, pay, pray, obey, pray, which yeah. we've said multiple times um, yeah. over the last few months. So, And, you know, it's interesting because um, one thing, I've, I've been only a college church for six months, and I'm seeing more and more something that one of our members shared with me. This church still is making a shift from a true institutional church a community church you know it was a time when you know if you were on the platform you were you know only people who were on the staff at AUC would be on the platform and and obviously there's no AUC so so you know and of course that's been a a, a long story in of itself but there's been this shift to saying well we are a community church it's all of us it's every person on the 1100 members on our on our official church roster, that's the church. And that's what we're trying to do is to, you know, have more uh, lay involvement. And, and you know, it's, I'm wondering when did this shift happen for all Protestant denominations from this lay movement to the professional, you know, you see it in the Methodist church, other churches. When do you think this happened where we made that shift in our thinking like, oh, that's the pastor's job. Well, I, I, I mean, you, I guess you could do it from like a sort of a sociological perspective where you yeah. could say like in the lifetime of a denomination or the lifetime of a church, um, you know, approximately here, yeah. you know, there's these different stages and, you know, there's like a sort of a missionary stage where everybody's on fire because they think they've discovered something new. And then there's the, you know, settling into, you know, we've got a few congregations or we're were spread out over a particular geographic area, so you become, you know, that's the beginning of institutionalization, and then after you become sort of an official denomination and you set up a hierarchy and, yeah. and, and, and official positions within the denomination, that af at that, from that point forward, you know, you tend to sort of go into the, the mode of, you know, just preserving the institution. Um, but from, a, from just from a theological perspective, I think the answer would be, when you lose that sense of missionary spirit. Yeah. You know, and churches tend to do that. It's unfortunate, but we have 500 years of Protestant history to sort of establish it. And we're not, you know, as much as we'd like to think that we're exempt from those things because we have this unique end time message, yeah. we're not exempt from those things. We're a Protestant church and we have to guard ourselves Actually, we've failed to guard. I would argue that we've failed to guard ourselves. And so we've, we've gone through that same sort of life cycle of every other Protestant denomination. Yep. And what we have to do is we have to, as an organization, um, we have to try and find a way to sort of recapture that missionary spirit. And it's, this isn't something that's, um, that's been lost on the church leadership at the worldwide level, at the division level, and even at the local level. You know, I mean, if you go and you talk to Pastor Dennis or Pastor Amoa, you know, they'll tell you, yeah, we have to, you know, we got to get away from yeah. this traditional model of the pastor does all the work and we do evangelistic series in a tent and people flock mm -hmm. to us to find out what the, the beasts mean in Daniel. And, you know, we get members and there's this, yeah. sort of, we have to get away from that and we have to get to, um, we have to get back to a more New Testament sort of, sort of model. And, I, you know, there's, um, 
I, th I think it was when Pastor Dennis was here a few weeks ago and he preached and he talked about he with the COVID-19, yeah. there's a number of churches that have sort of split up into small groups, you know, because yep. like a church like this one, I'm, I'm not making any suggestions, but a church like this one, you have a people from a lot of different places around. It's not like everybody lives around here in Lancaster, right. Clinton, and Sterling. And so people come from all over, and what some of these churches have done is they sort of split up into small groups in the neighborhoods where they came from, and they've formed this sort of like company type of, yep. type oh, yeah. of thing, and they intend to stay that way. And I yeah. think that that's, it's not the right decision in every case, right. but um, you know, in some cases it probably is the right decision because we're supposed to be reaching out into the community and I yeah. guess we're going off on a tangent now, but you're right. Like we, this church was a, a, an institutional church. We didn't have to do anything to fill the pews because there was, there's you know, a thousand students across the street and a hundred, hundred something faculty yeah. who came here every week. Yeah. And then the village church was like, well, if you don't want to go to the college church, it's a little less formal or something. Yeah. You know, you can go to the Brazilian church. And if you speak another language, well, there's a Haitian church yeah. and a Portuguese church and a Spanish church. Yeah. And you didn't really have to do anything to get people in the pews. You know, I think also, I think there was a shift. That's a, the big issue in 1863 was when the Adventist church officially organized. And that was a hot potato, hot issue, because it was felt like, well, if we do, we're going to become like the other denominations. Interesting enough is part of the reason to organize was for tax exempt status. You, the government, if you were a, if you were a, a, a religious organization, you need to be able to say we're a recognized uh, institution that has a board, you know, has a structure, you know, has a way of processing funds, and et cetera, et cetera. So it was very practical and pragmatic reason for 1863 to organize. But I think it's been a two-edged sword because now we're like, okay, well, you are sort of like you know, a, a denomination. And, and, and it was, that decision was made in 83 for, for very good reasons. Um, but here we are, and I think there's another thing that's, I think that's changed. I grew up in a time when, you know, still there was a, a largely a single income family. Mm -hmm. You know, now I am also, and I live in, and my wife and I have lived in that dual income situation. And uh, we know well what that's like. And there's only, you know, you work 40 hours, you got your commute, um, you know, and there's only so many, like I said, it's 20, only 26 hours in the day, you know. <laughs> and, right. you know, there's, there, there's, you know, somebody works 8 to 5, they have an hour commute. So that's 7, that's 6 to, no, I'm sorry, 7 to uh, 6, come home, cook supper, clean, guess what happens? You're tired, you know? Oh, there's board meeting that night. Well, maybe, you, you know, you, you get to board meeting, you're exhausted, you, there's another hour or two, you get home, it's 9, 9.30, and next thing you know, the alarm clock is still gonna ring in the morning. And, and this has been a challenge, you know? This has been a challenge, so. Um, but anyway, we're off on a tangent, but how it's all related, um, and I think the key is, is to, to look every church member in the eye and say, do you know your spiritual gifts? Do you know you're part of the body of Christ? And, and what role do you play? What function are you playing in that organization, in that body? So I want to encourage us, if you don't mind, we'll jump. First Corinthians, I think, to me, is a key um, passage. Um, Which one did you say? I'm sorry. First Corinthians 12. Oh yeah. Sunday's lesson, and and we seem to lesson seems to focus a lot, and rightfully so, on First Corinthians 12. Um, you know, I was thinking about this, and I want to talk touch on it a little bit later on. What what was the church in Corinth really like? You know, scholars see it as probably a very transient church. Um, it was located in a place that had a lot of commerce, people coming and going, um, many different backgrounds, walks of life, and, and there was a church there. 
founded by, I believe, Paul. And, and uh, it's like, you know, what was the feel of that church? I went through my, my mental list this morning, and I believe this is the 10th church I've pastored when you count all the churches. And I'm telling you, every church you pastor has a different climate, different atmosphere, different uh, energy. I know it sounds weird, but you know, there's a difference, there's a difference there. And, and uh, I wonder what it was like in Corinth. What was it like there? Uh, Roger, could you read 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13 for us? Sure. For as the body is one and has many parts, and all parts are of that body, though many are one body, so also is Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Would you mind throwing in 14 as well? Sure. So the body is not one part, but many. So does this literally mean that each one of our members is a part of the body? Yes. Yes. And has an essential, and I don't, you know, that, that word essential, that you have an essential, there's an essential part that every church member is intended yeah. to play yeah. in, the, in, the, in the work of the church. Yeah. How do you think... We, we you know, like let's say let's go through a role and somebody gets baptized and and i remember when i was baptized at a, at a young age um you get baptized it's a super wonderful sabbath day and and for me it was the winter time and it was in the church and you're baptized everybody says welcome to the family etc cetera, etc cetera. and then the next sabbath what happens you come to church, you're in your Sabbath school class, you go. And, and what should happen? And this is, this is I'm all, I don't have any, I sort of have an answer, but I'm thinking what should happen? In that week's time? Yeah, or, or over in the coming weeks. What do you think? Well, I think it depends on the individual. And it depends. I would, I, would, I would hesitate to give a hard, fast answer. Right. Yeah, I'm not looking for black and white. I'm just thinking. You know, I think over time, obviously, if, if, I, if I'm getting your drift, you know, like over time, what should be happening is, you know, like you said, there should be a, a method or a, a process for helping that person discover what their role is, at least at that point, because yeah. roles can change over time. Um, but what that person's role is in the church, what their spiritual gifts are, exactly. what talents and, and, and abilities do they have. And, um, you know, because obviously God called that person at that particular moment in that particular church at that particular time yep. um, in order to accomplish some purpose. Yep. So in other words, so like we should do, like somebody should, as I see it, somebody should sit down with that person and say, Anar or Roger, I'm so glad, I'm so glad you're part of the church family. Tell me about yourself. What do you enjoy doing? What are some of your talents? What are your, what are your passions? Well, it could be anything from, I just love football or skiing or rock climbing to, you know, I love singing or I love to organize things or I love just talking with people. You know, I just love having gatherings, you know. And then that person could, you know, sort of compile a picture and say, hey, I think I have an idea here. You know, what if you were to, or I love computers, you know, and, and plug that person into a particular ministry. Um, and sadly, so, so, and I'm guilty myself, some, so often in the business, business of life, it doesn't happen. And, and uh, slowly learning, you know, but we need to change this model to say, this is not, we're not just making somebody to come, pray, pay, and obey. We're bringing somebody here who is an integral part of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And what role does he or she play? And that's, that's where I see we need to, to really change our mechanisms to, to foster. And then I'm saying this is because 
there's many people today who have been a member for five, ten uh, decades, not ten decades, five, six decades, and they still don't know, you know. So it's never too late. But so Paul here is telling us here that, that each one of us has a role to play. We have something to do. And, and why do you think he picked the metaphor of a body? Yeah. But we need our prophets. Yeah, we need our prophets. So, um, well, the th you know, we, we do tend to, so, I mean, why did Paul, I mean, I don't know, Paul did it because the Holy Spirit told him to, because he was Paul and he was a really smart guy. Um, but in the 21st century, I can take that and I could use, I can use that in, in an analogy. You can say, like, you know, think of the smallest piece of your body, you know. Yeah. Think of like your, the, the parts of your cell, the nucleus of your cell, or the mitochondria. You know, like we, we would all die if we didn't have mitochondria. You know, but it's this tiny little thing that you need a microscope to see. Yeah. You know, and we think about our eyes, and you know, Paul uses the foot and the hand, head, and all these different sorts of things, parts of the body. But then in terms of the church, you know, I can, you can go down and say like, you know, what's the, what's the smallest thing that you can think of? What's the, what, name a part of your body that you could do without. You know, you know, it's interesting you said that because I meant to bring this article I had, and the organ or the gland in your body that helps you fall asleep is as small as the size of a grain of rice. Mm. Now, think about that for a moment. If you didn't have that, you know, tiny gland, your life would be miserable. Right. Not being able to sleep. I've known people who, I know people who have a really hard time sleeping at all. And, and that gland, that small, tiny, rice-sized gland. But anyway, I cut you off here, but I just wanted to share. No, you know. no, no, that's a perfect illustration. Like you have these small parts of your body that you don't even really, you don't even really know that they exist. Yep. Right? We're not, we're not conscious of, of, of these different, you know, pituitary gland and all these different things in our, yep. in our bodies. But without them, we would, we would perish. We would, would. you know, our, we, our biological life would end. And um, so we have to, so, you know, I think in, in, in applying Paul in, the, in, in today's environment, you now you can say that there are all sorts of moving pieces inside the church that we don't even realize, you know, like that there's somebody here to open the door every mm -hmm. Sabbath and make sure, you know, everything's in order, you know. There's someone... Um, you know, turning on the AC or turning on the heat. Yep. Abraham's running our AV system. Thank you. Right. There's a there's a guy in the back pushing buttons, and nobody really even realizes what yeah. that person's doing. You know, ever since COVID-19 started, there's a, there's three or four people downstairs in a room that nobody else ever goes into. It's true. That's true. You know, with computer keyboards and mice and 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 and, and stuff, and and running the cameras and editing everything and making sure that scriptures appear on the screen or your phone yeah. number or whatever, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the things, though, that I would mention, and I, I, I might be jumping ahead here, but I want to draw in, since I'm on the topic and I'm thinking about it so I don't forget, but one of the verses that they gave us this week was Isaiah, I think it was 43, 43, 10. So listen, Roger, I'm going to make an announcement for the, I don't know if this is for Abraham probably more for downstairs, but my wife texted me, um, the volume on the live stream is low. So I don't know, that's downstairs. Um, I wonder if anybody could run. Dennis, could you just let them know downstairs by text or vit, just let them know that we're getting some input that the volume needs to be boosted on the broadcast. And then I got another, one. Oh, okay, that's a, something else. So, but Isaiah, please take us there, Roger. Oh, no, no, it's fine. Um, so, but Isaiah 43.10, and I think I'm jumping ahead, but... Um, That's perfectly fine. Uh, uh, but I'll, I'll read it. Isaiah 43.10, um, this is God speaking. You, and he's speaking to, through the prophet Isaiah, he's speaking to the children of Israel. 
You are my witnesses, the Lord's declaration, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. No God was formed before me, and there will be none after me. The mm. first part of that verse is the one I want to focus on, though. You are my witnesses, the Lord's declaration, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me. You are my witnesses. You know, you'll hear in, in like secular discussions, you know, and, and things like that with, with, with opponents of Christianity or opponents of theism, um, they'll say like, well, if God's there and he has all of these things that he wants us to do, well, why doesn't he, you know, give a speech at the United Nations or like on the White House lawn or something where everybody's going to know? And yep. it's, I mean, you know, tongue in cheek, it's sort of like, well, in today's environment, if God were to do that, I don't think anybody would believe him. Yeah. Nobody would listen, you know, number one. Um, but number two, you know, God is God, and he made decisions based on his perfect knowledge. And so for whatever reason, he has chosen to use human beings as his instruments. Yeah. And I think one of the things, since we're on the topic of like jobs in the church, not really, jobs maybe is the wrong, but roles in the church, yeah. roles in the body of Christ, um, I think a lot of times going back to the, how we started the discussion off, talking about institutionalization and stagnation and things yeah. like that, we become so insular. Mm -hmm. So when it, when it comes time for people to be involved in the church, the church isn't really doing, if the church isn't doing what it's supposed to be doing, which is reaching out into the world, witnessing to yeah. the gospel, yeah. um, then the roles are going to sort of become stagnant themselves. Because a stagnant church is a church that becomes insular yep. rather than reaching out. And so those roles inside the church are going to become stagnant as well. So, you know, you snatch people up and you put them to work immediately and everything's right here in the church. Over time, I think people can lose a sense of purpose in that, you know? Yep. And then you have, you have burnout, you know, you have the same person being the Pathfinder leader for a decade. You have the same person teaching juniors for a decade, you know, whatever. And, and it becomes this sort of like positive feedback loop in, in just keeping the church sort of like in this like mm -hmm. stagnant state because then like you, cheat, you teach Sabbath, same, same Sabbath school class for 10 years and then you get a young couple that gets baptized together and you're like, oh, praise the Lord. You know, you're gonna teach Sabbath school now. I'm gonna train my replacement, you know? And then you push it off on them and then, but that's a mistake because those people haven't been sort of trained in, yep. in, in the gospel yet. And, um, you know, if, I think if we have this focus, if we, if we learn as a church to, to push our focus outward, like yep. you're talking about the transition from an institutional church to a community church, yep. if we embrace that, then this, these sorts of things start to take care of themselves. Yep. That's why in 1844, there wasn't, this, there wasn't this problem so much. Right. You know, everybody was involved because everybody saw the purpose. Yep. Everybody agreed on the purpose. But, you know, if I asked, if you go, you know, if we had a full congregation and you did a poll, I mean, I would be interested to see, like, what people, what's the purpose of the college church? Mm -hmm. And that has been, that road, that path has been trod many times before I came and, and you know, searching for an identity and a purpose um, and God's going to provide. God will provide. But that's, that's a very good question. Um, yeah. You know, what's interesting is, 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 you know, there's a church growth principle called natural church development. And you may be familiar with it. But the premise of it is that a healthy body is a growing body. Translate that over to the, a healthy church is a growing church. And, you know, that's the key, as I see it, is to have a healthy church. And, and something occurred to me as we looked at 1 Corinthians. Um, but, so we're clear that every person has, indeed, has a gift, right? Every believer has a gift to be, to be used. Um, okay, got a text. Thank you downstairs. The, the volume is better. Got a text. The volume is better. Um, now, there's something that's interesting about 1 Corinthians. And I'm just going to sort of jump around here. 
Um, but if let's jump to First Corinthians chapter four, uh, chapter one, four through nine. Now it's interesting the way Paul begins his letter. He has a salutation, and in verse four, I always thank God for you because of His grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in you, for in Him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all with all knowledge. God thus confirming your testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. You do not lack any spiritual gift. Now, it's interesting. I'm going to just go off on a tangent here. I want to to preach for a moment. Paul is writing in 1 Corinthians 12, he gives a list of spiritual gifts. There's also a list in Romans chapter 12. Those two lists are not exactly the same. They're not exactly the same. So the church at Corinth could say, well, we don't have this gift. We don't have that gift. So we're not complete. But Paul just says, you're complete. You have everything you need. But there was one thing that Paul has with the church at Corinth. Now, scholars believe that there may be two other letters to Corinthians that are missing, you know, up to two. But he writes 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. And my goodness, we love to read 1 Corinthians 13. It's a beautiful chapter. It's really a picture of God. But why did he write that? He just writes 1 Corinthians 13 right after 1 Corinthians 12. He says, here's the gifts. But I tell you what, you guys, he's telling the church of Corinth, this is nothing if you don't have love. So he says, you need love. Now, fast forward, he writes the second letter, what we have is the 2 Corinthians. Has the church perfect? No. He's still writing about problems in the church. He's still writing. In some cases, he's even kind of defensive. And so I'm saying this because, you know, we look at a church and, and, you know, when when we do the nominating committee, which we're doing right now, um, it's like there's dozens and dozens and dozens of official church offices to fill. And it can almost be overwhelming to look, well, we need this person, that person. And having pastored churches which are on the very small spectrum to now one on the larger in in membership on the spectrum, um, I've seen it all. Um, But what's interesting is, you know, either way, in every church you have that percentage, that 80-20 principle. And you're probably familiar with that, where 20% of the people are doing 80% of the work. Um, That seems to be a guiding principle, or not principle, but just a a reality of what's going on. Um, I'm saying all this to get to the point that we may say, well, we don't have such and such, so we can't operate. The church at Corinth didn't have, one could walk into there and say, you're missing this, or you're missing that. But Paul assured them, says, you have what you need. You're complete. And I'm saying this because it's easy to say, you know, oh, we don't have this and we don't have that. And, and I've been in churches where we were, we, it was a, a music desert. Now we have a musical uh, tropical f- forest. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I have. And I'm, I'm pr- blessed to have. And so, you know, but you may have, well, we don't have this or that. But we, we, work, we work with what we have. We work with what we have. We ask the Lord to bless those ministries and the fellowship of the believers. And, and we move forward in faith. So i just sharing that the key is as, as total membership involvement, TMI we call it. Mm-hmm. You know, have everybody involved in the program because every person has a role to play. Um, so I, would, I would just add too that that so like with the nominating committee thing like that that list of church offices is not an exhaustive list correct of 
roles that people can play in the church. Yep. And stop thinking about the church. I would say stop thinking about this. Think about the church like Paul thought about the church. Right. Paul didn't think about it, the church as a building that needed a $300,000 roof and a, <laughs> you know, someone to, to mow the grass and someone to come and make sure that the heat was on at the right times of the year and all that kind of, that, that's not how Paul saw the church. Right. You know, you talk about Corinth being a, you know, sort of a commercial center. Ephesus was similar. Yeah. Um, and Ephesus was also like a, a, a learning center. It was sort of like a, you know, a university town type of, yeah. type of place. And like, if you go to the different, different churches, the New Testament churches for which we have um, correspondence, um, you sort of see the same mindset that Paul had towards each congregation. It wasn't limited to this, you know, this, this one place in this one geographic area. Yeah. You know, this is a global, universal sort of movement. And, you know, I'll just throw out too, like in, in sort of Seventh-day Adventist terms, you know, I remember growing up, actually when I first went to Southern, when I first matriculated to Southern, um, you know, you still had in our institutions, you had a lot of vocational um, programs. You know, there was this very broad, wide, you send your, you know, whether it was in the academies or in our colleges and universities, you had a very broad and wide sort of selection of, of, of um, programs. And part of the background was that you know, you sort of taught people, like, it doesn't matter what, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're talented in carpentry, but you're not going to become a mathematician, yeah. say, you can still go, and you're still on this campus, and you're still part of this community, and the carpenter has just as important a role to play in the work of the church as the person studying Greek and Hebrew who's destined to yeah. become a theologian or a pastor or whatever. Absolutely. So, and we've, we've kind of lost that. Yeah. And I think it comes down to, too, like, are we adapting? You know, we talked about uh, at the beginning there about, like, the, the, the new environment that we're in. Um, are, we, are we adapting ourselves to our environment? Mm -hmm. You know, are we adapting uh, temporarily, you know, the 21st yeah. century? Are we adapting ourselves to the 21st century environment? That doesn't mean adopting new ways of thinking and abandoning, you know, important gospel concepts. That just means that, you know, the way we do church was, you know, it was, we, this was built in the 16th century. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, literally, the way it we was, do church was sort of, it, it, it was yeah. built in the 16th century. The idea of having a, you know, one person who kind of does everything and every, all the actions up here. I mean, really, that's a Roman Catholic oh, sort yeah. of idea. Yeah. You know, somebody's up here, you know, throwing incense around and saying the right words out of a book. But really, the New Testament version is all the work is really going on out there. And actually, in all reality, this is this is just a this is this is a breather. This is a, right. a refresher. This is where you come to get your batteries recharged. Yeah. All the work's really going on out there somewhere. Amen. And Amen. you know that's when when Paul talks about every every in in First Corinthians every good gift, you know, you, you, you're fully equipped. Every church is fully equipped. Every church is fully equipped. Look, Jesus took 13 random, by our, by our standards, random um, people in, in, in Roman-occupied Judea and yeah. turned it into a movement that literally conquered the world. Yep. You know, so in, in just a couple of centuries. Absolutely. I'm you, you got me going on, on a text here. Um, I want to jump to Acts because you triggered something in my mind. Acts chapter 10, verse 36. <coughs> it says here, talking about the early church, you know that the message of God sent, <coughs> excuse me, the message that, <coughs> excuse me, you know the message God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. So this is, this is really, you know, what it's about, Jesus was went around about doing good and healing people, <clears throat> you know? <clears throat> and I remember, you know, 
I don't think we should do this again, but there was a time that in every Sabbath school class, an inventory was literally taken, and they would ask all the members how many articles of clothing were distributed, how many pe people's a litter. You remember that? You know? And, and, and they would dutifully write it down, and then they would mail it in to the conference office. And, well, one day I was in the conference office, I said, what do you guys do with those reports? They said, nothing. <laughs> you know? And it was sad, but there was no, like, grandiose tally of all the articles of clothing. It just went in a file, or maybe it's even a circular file. But my point is, is it did serve one good purpose. You know, it said, hey, next week, can I give out an article of clothing? Can I give out some literature? Can I pray with somebody? You know, it sort of held our feet to the fire. Um, and that's maybe, you know, I know one church that I've heard about, maybe we should do that here. As you left the sanctuary, there was a big sign saying you are now entering the mission field. And maybe something so simple like that, walking out, the mission field is out these doors, you know, and to, to say, okay, Lord, I got seven days now between next time, today and next Sabbath. Help me to you know, shine your light to one person each day, you know. Help me to connect with one person each day in the next seven days, you know, and just to, even if it's a prayer, or give a piece of literature, pray, you know, I'm, or is it prayer, you know, uh, you know, do a nice deed for, you know, I know Cameron was talking about helping somebody put up a TV, you know, something like that. So, um, but that's the key is, is you know, I want to I wanna briefly get into the spiritual gifts because, and if I was with Mark Finley on this, I might say, listen, you need to fine tune something here. Because in Ephesians, it clearly says that there are, well, let's just go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter, uh, Ephesians chapter 4. And it's verse 11 to 16. And speaking about holding your feet to the fire, I mean, this does that for me. And, and he says here, um, Ephesians 4, 11, and I'm, we're not going to read the whole passage, but I'm going to read, start with verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers, so far so good, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. There's that healthy body is a growing body. The healthy church is a growing church. So the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So here's the thing. You have the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers. The role there is to equip people. To equip people. You know, I'm doing a Bible study that I'm really enjoying right now, and, and actually I've got two going. I'm enjoying them, and, and ultimately the, the end goal is to see that person find their spiritual gift and use it and become an active, those that become active members of the body of Christ. And, and you know, I'm saying this because, you know, it mentions evangelists. There's prophets, there's teachers, evangelists. You know, sometimes, I'm going to get myself into trouble here. We have put our members on guilt trips. You know what I'm saying? We have put members on guilt trips. Pastors are guilty of this and say, this is Sabbath afternoon. You need to go knock on doors. <laughs> you know, or you need to go do this. Or you got to, you know, and, and we put a guilt trip on people. I think we need to embrace the fact that not all of us are evangelists. Now, all of us can connect with another person and, and in our own context, you know, share with that person what the Lord has done for us. You know, 
But for me to say, because somebody told me, well, here's the new program of the year, so this is what you're going to do. And, and that's, that's not right. You know, it's putting that square peg in a round hole, you know. Somebody here may have a ministry that has never been conceived of in the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, you know. Somebody may have that ministry. And, and uh, I see that happening here. Like, I know we have a book club. That's, that's awesome, you know. I've never seen that really happening before in a local church before, you know. We have other programs going on, and with COVID, everything's sort of been put on hiatus. Um, but I'm looking at Margarita over there, who just published a book, and, you know, how God has been using her, you know. And the list goes on and on. So, um, you know, I'm just thinking here is, is, you know, if we walked into the church at Corinth one Sabbath morning, what would we see when they were functioning, you know? First of all, we may be meeting in homes. Um, secondly, who was in charge? What was happening? What was, the, what was the conversation like? You know? And they would get this letter from Paul. And he says, this, we're going to read this letter from Paul. And, and then ultimately get to the love chapter. But he says, oh, wow, we all have a role to play. Paul, think, Paul thinks we, we're, we're a body. Okay, so who's doing what? You know, and it was very organic and, and uh, um, you know, almost spontaneous, you know. So, anyway, I just went off on a tangent there, but I just wanted to share that, that you know, God may put a, 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 an idea in somebody's mind saying, hey, we've got to do this. You know, here's a possibility of a ministry. We're here to say we're here to support you. You know, if somebody says, we need a skateboarding ministry. <laughs> well, how do we do that? I have no idea, but let's think about it. Like, what, how, what would that look like? You know? Well, um, if, you turn, if you turn to the end of this week's lesson in the book, in the mission story this week, the mission story, this is probably the first time where I've read the mission story, and there's actually like this clear, boom, like bulb goes off <laughs> connection, right? Because um, sometimes I'll read the mission story and be like, I don't think this has anything to do with what we just studied. But this week it actually does. And it's in South America, which, you know, you, you might have heard me if you paid attention, you, you hear me say this, but Christianity is growing exponentially in the global South. Yeah. Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, exponential growth, right? As in Western Europe and the United States, Christianity just keeps shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. In, in parts of the world that have been racked with things like poverty, totalitarianism, and, and, and things like that. But what they've done, and what the mission story, if you read it, what they've done, and I believe it's Uruguay, um, they've created these things they call urban influ centers of urban influence yep. or something yep. along those lines. Yep. But man, like, we don't do anything like that. And my only question is like, well, why not? Yep. Look at the world around us, especially in the last six months, you know? I mean, I know before COVID, I know we were trying to get like a, uh, a um, uh, English as a second language um, yeah. school going on downstairs in the basement. You know, you talk about skateboard ministries and, and I mean, you know, there's all these possibilities and opportunities and instead we've just, we're, we're sitting here navel gazing. Yeah. That's really, I mean, like, and I'm just as guilty as anybody else. This isn't me, you know, trying to be, you know, mean-spirited or, or accusatory towards anyone in particular, but just as an institution. And I think if you went to our leaders and you said, hey, we've, we have collectively navel-gazed for the last 50 years, these people, if they're realistic, will say, you're absolutely right. Yep. What are we going to do about it? And the problem is in the church what, what you see in, what, what, you know, where I would distinguish us today from Corinth and Ephesus and those things is today we sit in the pews and we expect him or his bosses over in the conference or in the union to come up with the solutions. Well, we have to stop doing that. Yeah. We, the congregation, we, the church, we're the church, you know what I mean? And everybody collectively has to start thinking in ways that, you know, maybe we do need to start 
taking, <laughs> having a little inventory <laughs> of how, what, you know, our good deeds for the week or whatever. Because, you know, shame is a powerful motivator. Well, and you don't, don't want to be the one guy, oh, I, I didn't do anything this week. <laughs> I don't necessarily think it's shame, though. I think it's, you know, maybe there's this... Um, it, it provided some context, you know, like you're supposed to be, you know, we're here in order to, like, I guess I would say this way, what, what is the purpose of the church? What's the church's purpose for existence? Yeah. So I, th I think, too, you know, something that intrigued me in my old church, we started a community center. And mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, COVID hit. And in my mind, I could see us having a community center in Clinton, you know, mm -hmm. where you know, get a storefront, fix it up, have seminars, and, and you know, and, and just staff it with the right uh, people who just, you know, are there for the right reason, the right time, right purpose, and, and uh, you know, and just go at it and say, hey, Adventists are normal people. We don't have three heads, and, <laughs> and we love people. And, you know, we know God has, God loves you and has a purpose for your life. And, and you know, COVID literally put all that on the back burner. You know, where is this all going? It's really a head-scratching moment because as I see it, if I had to envision the future, I think Zoom is going to be with us even after the vaccine. I think some of our ministries are going to still be done on Zoom and, and uh FaceTime, all these different platforms. Um, but when we do resume, my friends, we've got to make the most of every day and, and of every dollar, you know. And we need to, you know, fund those things that are really going to work and do something. And we may even find we'll do something that doesn't work, but at least we tried it. At least we looked underneath that stone, you know. Yeah. I mean, I just, we're, we're, our, our purpose is... It, the way I see it, our purpose is to continue the work that Jesus started yep. 2,000 years ago. And what yep. did Jesus do? Jesus did two, two primary things. He, he met people's physical needs, yep. whatever they were, met their physical needs, whether it was health-related or whatever, met their physical needs, and he announced the, the arrival of the kingdom of God. Yep. Those are the two things that Jesus did. He set the captive free. Set the captive free Amen. by welcoming and them into, yep. you know, and, and the, the great controversy theme is perfect for, for that message, you know, you know, by, by welcoming, welcoming them into a different sort of citizenship, you know, yep. you're, 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 you're held captive in this life through whatever the addiction or, 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 or abuse or um, financial troubles, whatever the case may be. Health issues, welcome, wel welcome them into you know, and it's it they they work hand in hand. It's not one and then the other. It's not you know let me let me do you know um I remember my wife and I bought a car a few years ago, and the um the salesman you know we're sitting there waiting for all the financing to come through and the salesman you know we're just talking whatever and somehow it wound up on church and religion and things like that. And he's telling me, you know, like, oh, you know, I knew this, uh, I knew this Catholic priest when I was a kid and um, he would feed the homeless, but the condition was they had to stick around for like a sermon, some sort of like, you know, yeah. preachy thing, you know. And, you know, th that's kind of what we do. It's like, well, I'll help you, but you have to listen to my spiel, you know what I mean? But the, the thing is, they, they work together. They're supposed to work together. And yeah. so like, you know, I think like, what, what would Jesus have done? You know, literally, WWJD, what would Jesus do? What would Peter have done? What would John, James, Andrew, all those guys, what, the, what would they have done in, in a place like that in downtown Clinton? Yeah, you know, that's right. Or, 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 or in an environment like this where someone says, like, oh, I, you know, whatever. The tropical storm came through and my, my fuse box is blown out. Yeah. You know, what do I do? Well, that's just you going over and without any expectation of anything in return, if you know how to do it, obviously I would not be the one, but you know, you go over and you help a neighbor, yeah. you know, you just reach out a lending hand. That's where that, like the inventory of how many articles of clothing did you pass out? How many meals were distributed? Yeah. It's about being in the community, being in the world, and then people looking at you and saying like, why did you do this for me? Mm -hmm. I yeah. didn't, you know, and ultimately the answer becomes, I didn't do it for you. This is Christ working for you on through me yeah i'm just an instrument you know what i mean and then just a lot of times if you just leave it at that 
you've just planted the seed. You don't have to preach the sermon. You don't have yeah. to hand out a track. You don't have to get them, you know, lined up for Bible studies. You've already got them thinking like, well, this is so different than the rest of the world. And really, like, that's when it comes to, like, our talents and our spiritual gifts. I don't mean to dominate the conversation here. No, this here. is good. But, you know, when it comes to our spiritual gifts, using them in such a way as to be so different from the way the world uses those same gifts yep. to get people to go, like, there's something different about that person. There's something different about that group of people, and I want to find out more. I want to know why. Yeah. So you, talk my memory here, we've got like eight minutes. So there's a quote in the lesson from Christ's Object Lessons. But for whatever reason, Finley cut out a sentence, and it's from Christ's Object Lessons, page 326. And, and I had actually origi- uh, underlined this years ago. Um, and I'm just going to quote a bit here. Our Lord teaches that the true object of life is ministry. It's pretty powerful. A couple sentences down, here's the, here's the punchline. By living to minister for others, man is brought into connection with Christ. The law of service becomes the connecting link which binds us to God and to our fellow man. When you read that first sentence, by living to minister for others, man is brought into connection with Christ, it's thinking, you can either look at it like, okay, I'm going to help that person become connected with Christ. That's not, I think, what she's saying. I think by living to minister for others, man, the doer, is brought into connection with Christ. Because then she says the law of service becomes the connecting link which binds us to God and our fellow man. There is something supernatural that happens when, like you said, when we do something for another person, there is something supernatural going on there. We are connected with God, we're connecting with the other person. And, and I think this is what's remarkable when Christ was at the, at the well, the woman at the well, he knew that. So he says, I need to make, get a connection with this lady, so I'm going to be the one who needs the help. <laughs> you know, so he asked for water. And he knew that once that dynamic gets started, the possibilities are endless. And they literally were endless because she rejoices, she goes back and tells, tells the town, come on, you got to meet somebody I've, I've met. And he knows everything about me. It's, it's remarkable. And, and that's probably the hardest part about COVID. It is reinforcing these bubbles we live in, you know. And, and it's just, it's frightening to think about the mentality and the social implications of where we will be in a year or two after the vaccine, you know. Will we have formed patterns of just standing six feet apart when you're in a line? Will our personal space at the grocery store be larger than it is than it was a year ago? You know, and it, it's interesting because I say that because we we have. Let's face it, there are times you can be in a, in a line in a grocery store or at the post office, and you begin chatting with somebody. You know, it's harder to do when you're six feet apart. You know what I'm saying? It's harder to do. So I just wanted to mention that somebody named Judith texted in here that we are all daily witnesses and evangelists as we go about our work to a store, etc. We have no idea who, who uh, no idea as to who we impress, hopefully in a positive way. And that's well put, very well put. So, um, Roger, any thoughts here as we wrap up? Um, just in reference to your, you know, what kind of have we are we, re, are, we are we reinforcing um, these social bubbles? And I would say that our job as Christians right now is to figure out ways to pop that bubble. Mm. You know, if you you talk about you know going and helping people, that the connection that forms um, the supernatural connection that forms between the doer of a good deed um, and and the Holy Spirit. You know, that's what God did. That's what Christ is. 
Yeah. Christ is a Christ is God looking down on humankind in desperate need of help, not even realizing the kind of help that they needed and just giving the help unasked. Yeah. You know, without any any you know God's reward for doing that is the joy of knowing that he'll get to live in relationship with other people or with people who formerly were were separated from him. And you know, as Christians, that's sort of the attitude. Again, the church's purpose is to continue the work that Christ started. It's to, to bring people into a relationship with their source of being, with their ground of being. And when you reach out and you, you, you just, for, for no other reason except to love someone and to attempt to love someone in the way that God loved them, in the way that Christ loves them, yeah. um, it does do something to you. And we have to find ways to 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 pop that bubble to overcome it and you know i think we i mentioned this maybe the last time that we did this a couple weeks ago but you know tertullian said you know like when he talked about the martyrs you know the roman the romans were persecuting christians and he said you know this is sort of a you know he was being a little bit cheeky but he's like you know the blood of the martyrs is oh, yeah. seed yeah. and you know, when the church faces crises, when the church faces, historically speaking, when the church faces difficult situations, that's when the church flourishes. Yeah. And I would argue that that's why, like I said before, in the global south, you have the churches are flourishing. Why? Because these are the places where Christianity was illegal, where you yeah. couldn't meet in groups, where it's seen as a subversive because it's against, you know, a communist government or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, you know, COVID and the, the social upheaval that we're seeing in our society right now, uh, politically and socially, might be the biggest blessing the church has ever it received. It might be. It might be. Because it's going to force us to act. Yeah. I pray that that's the case. Yeah. Me too. And, and, and I'm thinking too, once we back, get back to normal, there also will be people who say, you know what I really miss? being a part of a church family and coming together, seeing each other's smiling faces um, and, and shaking hands, hugs, all this, the good stuff about church. Um, and that they'll be like, I got to get back, you know, and, and uh, let's pray that they, that they, that day is going to be very soon. So why don't we pray together as we wrap up. Father in heaven, Lord, I want to thank you for your grace. We want to thank you for your grace that we've all accepted into our lives. But Lord, it, along with that is an identity that we are a part of a very important body called the body of Christ. Lord, I want to pray that each of us who are uh, hearing this and are, are, are with us today in this lesson will realize that and we will truly embrace that gift, that ability, that skill we have, and use it for your honor and for your glory, for the upbuilding of the body of Christ. We just want to pray that as we go through this COVID uh, quarantine, the shutdown, all the stuff that's been going on, that the body of Christ will not suffer as a result of it. We pray that the body of Christ, if anything, will grow stronger through this, and that whether it be in six months or 12 months or, or, or 18 months, we'll look back and we'll see that this was a time in which, in which the body of Christ essentially grew stronger and prepare, was prepared for the future. Please, Lord, be with each and every one of us. May we embrace and use those abilities, those talents, those skills uh, that you have given to us May we use them for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.